Management Task Force, uh, which Denise and I co-chair. Uh, today's program is co-sponsored by the TIPS Cybersecurity and Data Privacy Committee and the TIPS Committee on Diversity and Inclusion. If you'd like to learn more about the task force and committees, TIPS members can find us on the TIPS community page. Today, we have two dynamic speakers uh, with us today, and uh, they are Diana Ikatani Iolano, who is the founder of a managing attorney of the Ikatani Law Corporation in El Segundo, California. And Joseph Rosinski is a technologist and futurist at Thomson Reuters in Washington, DC. It's a pretty uh, impressive uh, title. So, <laughs> and so as, uh, as both of them um, will be giving their presentation today, they're going to be pulling back the curtains and giving us a glimpse into the future of our profession and the impact of uh, technology on us and on our profession. Uh, just a quick housekeeping. If you have any questions during the webinar, uh, please type them into the Q&A box. And with that, I will go ahead and turn the presentation over to Joe and Diana. And I think, Joe, you're starting us off. I am. All right. Thank you so much, Debbie. And thank you all for joining today. Really looking forward to this conversation. Let me pull this up. Hopefully it's coming up uh, and it's clear for everybody. Debbie, just get a quick check to make sure it's up. Is it looking... Looking good? Yep, it looks great. All right, wonderful. All right, absolutely looking forward to this. I can't wait to get into this. There's a lot to go through. Um, I'm gonna take part one and Diana's gonna take part two. My name is Joe Rosinski. As, as mentioned earlier, I'm based in DC. I serve as this crazy role within Thomson Reuters, basically looking and peering into the future about what potentially could happen with technology as it filters into the legal industry. So we're gonna to touch on some of that in just a second. As you can see this beautiful video, <laughs> that's not quite where we're at yet, but we'll get there in the not too distant future. It's gonna be faster than we can all imagine. But let's start talking about the great unknown. Uh, where we are today when it comes to technology as it filters into the legal industry, the first thing I wanna do is sort of open it up the, our eyes, open our eyes up to this, this amazing potential that we all have. I know that there's a lot of things that we're all going through, either personally with the pandemic, uh, culturally with everything that's going on around the world um, in the United States. But if we put that as a side, just for a second, just for a second, and just look through the lens of technology and the potential that we have as a society to advance the ball for everyone, hopefully on a much more level playing field. Um, that's the ideal, that's the goal, and that's where we hope we can be able to get to. And I think we'll be able to do that a little bit better than we ever had in the past, utilizing technology. So let's talk about what some of that looks like. A lot of this stuff is going to bridge the gap of what we've traditionally seen as attorneys, lawyers doing what they do and practicing what they do, but also opening that up so that you are now potentially working with engineering, engineers, right? So in the engineering departments, working with design people, working more and more with business. I know a lot of you work with business people uh, over the years, certainly but all this stuff is starting to converge. So what does this really look like? Well, let's talk about some examples. And I'm gonna sort of fly through these just to peer into, the, into what we're going to see in the not too distant future, right? So this is what I'm, I'm saying, the nearer term from 2020, so last year, all the way through to 2025, what does that look like? Well, yes, drone delivery is starting to happen in different parts of the world right now. It's only our regulations that's sort of holding us back at, in the, at the moment in time. Driverless cars, yes, we know that this is coming and with some of the Tesla models right now, you can pay an extra $10,000 and apparently have this added to it. And it's pretty much takes us to the point where it is driverless. Okay, 3D printing, what does that look like? And what impact will that have on the industry as you start to think about as it may impact uh, your practice? It's not only the printing of those particular items that you might have broken a taillight in your driverless car, because your car just went on a little hay haywire there for a second, but it's also printing food. So based on the recommendations from your doctor, maybe you're deficient in vitamin D. Well, it'll produce this for you. So these are the types of things that we're going to see. If you haven't seen this as of yet, this is a newer form of AI that is kind of frightening because we always talk about the overreach of AI in terms of what it can really do versus what we're expecting it to do. This is the first instance where we're really starting to see that change. And what that means is that this is a sort of a Elon Musk project. It's called GPT. 
you're able to talk to your computer and do things that are just unimaginable before, almost if you wanted to create a web page. Let's say you are a, a solo shop and you want to create a website for yourself. You can actually speak to your computer and it builds that website for you just by voice. I want to change the font color. I want to put a picture up in the left-hand corner. You provide guidance in an oral fashion and it produces that. So these things are starting to happen. This is a big one for all of you uh, in the legal industry. DAOs. If you haven't seen this, this is distributed autonomous organizations. These are blockchain-based organizations that are going to be coming into play where you have an entire organization that's built on code, contracts that are built on code that are stored on a blockchain. And we'll talk about blockchain in just a second. But the ability for companies to produce themselves in such a fashion where you only need a handful of people to come up with a concept and it automatically self-executes on different things. Clearly lots of opportunity in different areas that you'll see in just a second. Massive regulations, contracts, litigation galore, because what if the code is, is improperly uh, created? Tons of opportunity there. So nearer term, we're talking about 2023 to 2027. We don't need to go down this road too far, but you get the idea, the smart toilet, to be able to pick up on different types of things that your doctor would love to know about. Are there problems with that? Yes, we'll talk about that in a second. Swarming of bots. Believe it or not, different bots are going to come out and they'll be able to create these swarms. Now, what kind of implications will they have? Well, we'll start to get into that in just a second. Smart dust, I think this is fantastic, made by Hitachi. And basically all those little uh, square dots you see over on the left-hand side are GPS enabled devices. They can basically, you can smear it on a car. You can smear it on an individual. Not a good thing, right? So we're talking about things that have privacy implications. We're talking about HIPAA issues, litigation and transactional opportunities galore. The idea that I'm painting here, as you'll see, and I have two more slides on these types of things, is that the opportunities that will be coming ahead are going to be the most grandiose things you could possibly imagine. And it's going to be amazing for the industry to sort of wrap their arms around and those who decide to go down these roads to understand some of these technologies, the implications, the, the dynamic nature of them will definitely, definitely reap the rewards from that on many different levels. So what is this? This is actually shape shifting matter. Yes, that is coming. There are groups that are working on that. It's a little bit further out there. This one is both frightening and disturbing at the same time. There are groups and there are countries around the world that are currently doing this. Uh, you hear about it in Beijing, right now in China. They have 1.2 million cameras that are positioned all over Beijing that are using facial recognition, such that if someone were to walk across the street and they're jaywalking, well, they get a social network score and they get pinged for that. Um, and maybe they're smoking in public where there's a no smoking sign behind them. The camera sees this, recognizes who they are, and then it pings them again. So at some point in time, they won't be able to get um, a loan or they may not be able to travel. Scary times to think about that. But there are also organizations that are using this type of technology right now for interviews. As everything has gone virtual, they're using your facial recognition, the expressions that I have on my face, on my eyes, on my lips, and the way that I say things, whatever the case is, during an interview to see if I'm lying or I'm not lying. These are the types of things that we have to start thinking about, the things that will definitely play a role in your world as in the not too distant future. Quantum safe cryptography. Basically, we're getting to the point where these machines, these computers, these chips are becoming so fast, we need to figure out what the best way of controlling that is. Um, because when we get this quantum computer that comes out, it breaks all or most all of encryption that's out there that you would use for your bank or for cryptocurrency, whatever the case is. This is a, a frightening one in and of itself. I tell people, if you have a kid that's born within the last few years, I would guarantee you within the next 30 years, they will probably have an implantable in their body that either connects into the internet or does something basic. These are the things that we're gonna be part human, part humanoid, part uh, uh, different device, which again, you can see legal impact on these types of things are regulations, security and privacy, transactional opportunities, of course, as well. So longer term, this is where it gets, Freak, freakishly bizarre, but things we need to think about, right? So DNA storage. 
we talk about storage being almost ubiquitous now. So the cloud storage is, is pretty cheap for the most part. Uh, it used to be very expensive. Way back in 1950, you had an IBM mainframe computer the size of a typical bedroom, and it held about five megabytes of RAM. What does that really mean? It means it, it held one MP3, one song. Now you can buy a chip the size of my fingernail that will uh, hold a million, trillion, whatever, a billion times more information. So DNA storage is actually coming. Imagine being able to store information onto a tree. You know, why would you do that? I don't know, but they're working on that right now to make it easier to actually store information. This is again where it gets bizarre. So AI board members and politicians, so the ability to actually have a machine that helps orchestrate those types of decisions at that level. This poor man is now at the point where dream reading and recording is going to be available, projected about 19 years from now. I don't know if I want that. This is, again, also out there. So artificial consciousness, so projected in 2060, will be at the point where we'll have artificial consciousness. Last but not least, human cloning. We're starting to see this in different parts of the world. I know that there's ethical considerations clearly that we're considering right now, and there's uh, it's forbidden in most parts of the world, but there are some areas, you know what, we'll open our doors to this type of thing. And they've gone down that road to be able them, to allow them to do that sort of thing. So again, the legal impact for some of these things are regulations and security and privacy and litigation and transactional opportunities galore. Now, what I wanna do, is go through two quick things uh, before we hand it off. Now, the first is blockchain. It's one of my personal favorites at this point in time. Um, we hear about it a lot in the cryptocurrency world, and that's just one facet of the entire thing. But what I want to do is illustrate the bigger architecture of it and how it will interplay within on the litigation side, on the transactional side, how people practice, as well as the business of law. And I think it's kind of a key to just get the basics around this. And you, I think I think you all are probably very familiar with it. But what I'm going to do is just for the, for the heck of it, go through it in just a quick little bit of detail to define it first. So for, of all things, blockchain is the underlying technology behind Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin came out in what, 2008, 2009, and we were like, why did it come out back then? We'll talk about that in just a second, but we think back to that time frame, and what did we experience? Well, it was a major financial decline. You had significant uh, banks that have been around for ages, 120, 140 years, going on under overnight. Um, these ripple effects happen not just in the United States, but across the world. There's a global impact because of the financial crisis that we all went through. So this is where it gets a little trippy. Um, and you have to, I beg your indulgence for a second. And that's where this comes into play. So this is either a man or a woman or a group of people, data scientists, we don't even know. They go by the name of Satoshi Nakamoto. And they wrote this white paper over here on the left-hand side. And I would encourage you, if you ever have the time, to take a gander at that thing. It's about 10 pages long. It's not terribly technical. But what it does is it outlines this whole new paradigm, this shift that I think we're all about to go into. And it's something that is, is totally counterintuitive. When I first started getting involved in this in, whatever, 2011, I was like, this doesn't make sense. So here's the, here's the, the thought. We saw those single points of failures. So banks going under and the ripple effect of that. AIG, the biggest insurance group in the world, on the precipice of falling under, if it were not for the federal government of the United States for bailing them out. So what they said was, instead of these single points of failure, let's distribute that. Let's come up with computers, 10,000, that all run the same software around the world. And the object of that is that they prove that something happened, that I want to send money to Diana. Well, I have a digital wallet. She is a digital wallet in the Bitcoin example. And I want to send her one Bitcoin. Well, what happens is that I put in, in, this, in a device, it could be on my phone, it could be on my computer, millions of different apps that interface with this. I put in, I want to send her one Bitcoin. Um, I put in her address and I click send. It goes out to a number of these different servers. And the servers basically have to verify one that I have one Bitcoin if I did, wouldn't that be amazing? Um, and then it verifies that yes, she has also a wallet. They then eventually come together and they say, yes, this is true, this is happening. And then fundamentally what it does is it secures that. So when you hear the word blockchain, just think of the word database. 
All that blockchain is, is a database that's distributed. But the special part about this is that it's peer to peer. It does not require any central banking authority, doesn't require any government agencies, relies on cryptography that's been around since, oh, the 80s. It's the same cryptography that we use for our banks. So it's trusted. It's been tried for the last 11 years. There's tens of thousands of people that are trying to hack this all the time. But what it does is it shifts from a single entity or a bunch of humans making a decision to a computer verifying that something's happening. Changes everything. So what does that actually mean? This is the big one. This is the one that I want to focus in on for a few seconds here. I know most of you probably don't have to deal with um, trusts and estates. Well, maybe some of you do, but as attorneys, um, you probably have people, whether it's friends or family saying, hey, you're an attorney. Can you do a will? You're like, ah, it's not my practice area, but sh sure, I'll do that for you. This will that I, that I wrote, it makes no sense, or it's kind of silly, let's put it that in sense, is written in word. I'm pulling the paragraphs down, of course, and it ultimately it says this. It says, uh, upon the parent's death, they have two kids, kid A and kid B. Both kids have to be married upon their death, or if one kid is married and one kid is not, the kid that's married gets 100% of the estate. So if they split the estate, if both are married, the one person gets the estate if it's just one person married and the other person's not. So that's written down. You're like, all right, great. It's put into Word, made into a PDF. It's notarized. You're good to go. This is the change that we're, we're about to see on the transactional side. It's then put into code. And I'm not ask, asking you all to go through the code itself. I'll walk you through this. But what the computer is doing is it's looking at the, the parameters that change in that document. So in that legal document, you're looking at parameters that change. So every single day, the computer goes out to a trusted source. It could be the federal government, it could be um, you know, Thompson Reuters, whoever. And it establishes that every day, parents are alive, parents are alive. One day it comes back and says the parents have passed. Heartless, it goes on to the next task. And that next, next task is, are both kids married? It determines that one kid is married and one is not. For the sake of argument here, indulge me for a second, all the assets are liquid and it sends all of that money to them. That entire right-hand side is codified. It's on the blockchain, it's verified, and it's all automated. It doesn't require any human intervention. Now, each one of you could be like, well, what if the data's wrong? You know, what if, totally accurate. And that's where you all are gonna come into, hand, in, into play with this because there's gonna be so much potential for litigation here. But the thrust of this going forward is that this will make things a lot more seamless and easier for us to interact, uh, access to justice. All these types of things will start to come about from that. Some other quick hits on this. Believe it or not, uh, while Bitcoin example is just one tangent and there are thousands of different blockchains right now, we're moving into the digital dollar. So we currently have, of course, dollars and checks and credit cards and all that stuff. But in one of the bills that came out in March or April of last year during 2020, during um, uh, the financial crisis that we had during the pandemic, they put this in. They were about to approve something that talked about turning us over to a digital dollar. That would mean that the federal government could send us money directly towards digital wallet, which is different than the digital wallet that we're used to with our banks but you would have direct access to the money, which would allow people who don't normally have access to that to get that sort of access. We're talking about new financial systems, disruptors to banks, but access for everyone in that space. Another quick concept that I wanna throw out there is, is DeFi. It stands for Decentralized Finance. Take the entire financial world that we know today from the digital dollar to the stocks, to the bonds, to real estate, all of that in the coming years, it may take 10 years, might be five years where we see a huge shift. All of that is going to shift over to blockchain into these decentralized models. You can see some of them up there right now. So investment, exchanges, derivatives, know your customer, KYC, AML. If you ever touched any, any money laundering com components, all of that is coming about. So new financial systems, disruptors to banks, access for everyone, which I think is one of the best things about all of this stuff. I threw this in just for the heck of it. I know I only have a few minutes left here, but non-fungible tokens, the worst nomenclature ever. But let me break this down. You see that picture up there? That's one of the first digital pieces of art. They did about 10,000 of them. None of them are alike. They're all slightly different. 
These were produced in 2017. And people are like, ah, they were given away. Now they've been sold for 100,000. So this one sold for $100,000. It's digital art that is non-fungible, which means it's unique, it's scarce, but you're seeing this across the board. So the tokenization of all assets. And then how are you going to look at that? When you're uh, you know, getting discovery together, whatever the case is, how are you looking at the, the ownership, tracking ownership of items? Well, a lot of that's going to rely on the blockchain. Jack Dorsey sold his first tweet for two, it's actually over that, $2.7 million not long ago. You might be like, well, I can go see his tweet any day I want on, um, I just pull it up. The person that bought this now has digital ownership of it, which means that they can either sell it for more or they can collect royalties on it. All art is eventually going to go in some direction online or at least become a part of that. So what we're talking about, too many words up there, is that you have unique identifiers related to art, could be a, related to anything though. We're talking about real estate, we're talking about any asset. All of that stuff is coming to fruition right now. Now, I know I'm going through a lot. I apologize. I'm happy to talk about this stuff offline if you, if you want to go down that road. Now, I want to go into a little bit about AI because Diana, she's going to go into this and I think I'm looking really looking forward to it. I've been talking about AI with our customers for years now. So talking with CIOs, managing partners, and everyone, whoever wants to talk about this sort of thing, this is what I went through. For probably six years ago, we were in stage one. So denial. People are like, there's no way, no how that AI is going to ever touch the practice or the business of law. That's changed. So in the last five years, we're like, all right, well, yeah, maybe there is going to be some changes. And we're seeing resources. And we're seeing uh, GCs rethinking how they do things, how firms are working differently, how they're taking advantage of new applications that are coming on the market to be able to better leverage and use these things. Stage three, depending on the moment in time when you catch me, this is either five years off, 10 years off, 15 years off, some significant disruption, um, which is going to be going to be fascinating to watch. Like I illustrated before, there's a ton of opportunity ahead. But the, the basis for what we've done in the past will change, will change a little bit. So we have to be prepared for that a little bit in our heads. All right, quick definition around AI. Now, AI for me is quite simply an algorithm. An algorithm, what is that? It's an if-then statement. That's really an it in a nutshell. We're talking about if this happens, then do that. Well, if that happens, then do this. It's a tree, a decision tree. There are many components, many algorithms, many different components under the auspices of AI. As you can see in here, things that we're used to, text to speech, speech to text, we speak in the Siri, we speak in the Google, whatever the case is, the ones in yellow are the ones that are most pertinent, most relevant in the legal industry. So we're talking about machine learning and natural language processing. All right, for the sake of time, this is the big bucket. It's rules-based systems. The subsets of the parts that you really start to see organizations looking at. So machine learning, supervised machine learning, unsupervised machine learning, and then deep learning. They're slightly different in terms of their nuance. Happy to talk about that offline. A really quick one though. If you wanted to look at cats and you wanted a billion pictures of cats because you wanted the machine to be able to do that, well, you can classify that. You can figure out this is the cat, this is the picture of the cat, this is where the cat resides, why? Because you want to be able to determine what the difference is here between the chihuahua and the, um, uh, the muffin, the blueberry muffin, right? So that's what the computers need to decipher and figure out. And they're trying to do the same sort of thing within discovery and every other part of the world. Now, the last thing I will talk about is something technically called overfitting. We're going to hear much more about this in just a second. Overfitting is a technical word for bias. And there is significant bias right now in a lot of the different algorithms. And it's incumbent upon the people that built the algorithms, as well as the data itself to sort of strike this balance, have different eyes focused on these types of things. So again, we're gonna hear much more about this, but that's the direction that we need to think about and, and uh, be concerned about in some respects. All right, I will stop uh, just on that. And um, I'm, I'm happy to wait till we take questions at the end, or we can take a few now. It's up to, uh, to uh, hear everyone here, so. Thanks, Joe. That was amazing. Um, and you kept my attention because you had cats and puppies and cupcakes <laughs> in there. So it was wonderful. I know. I, I think it's amazing and terrifying all at the same time. 
but I'm really excited um, to think about these new applications as we as we look at what the future of law looks like. Um, I think that there are a couple of questions in the Q and A. Um, one was specifically, what was the name of the essay that you said to read? And I think it was the Satoshi uh, Nakamoto one. Yes, absolutely correct. Yes, yeah, Satoshi Nakamoto wrote a white paper, and you should be able to find it. I think it's at Bitcoin.org. But if you just type in uh, Satoshi Nakamoto or just Bitcoin itself in white paper, you should be able to find it. Great question. Okay. And there's another question about how big a threat are these technologies to the Constitution? Uh, it's a fantastic question. Um, if you look at almost the beginnings of this, in the first part that we're going to see is, is just the monetary policy. If you now have a shift to uh, currencies that are not the U.S. dollar, the first thing you're going to see is, is China. So today it's official. They've released their digital currency, um, which they're going to be able to um, use their Belt and Road project, which means the entire world that China is working with. So all of Africa, all of Latin America is going to be using their digital currency. So that has a real um, uneasy feeling. If you're looking at things from that sort of power, power thingy, that's something we have to be considered, uh, think about. And then when it comes to the constitution itself, there's going to be challenges. I mean, when you have at some point where code becomes law and that sort of translation, and then maybe algorithms that are built on top of that, that are judges, that are helping judges making decisions, that's also one that we really have to, to think about too. Great question. And there's one more question uh, that I see in the chat, which is why rules-based algorithms instead of agnostic algorithms? Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I think it starts off with rules-based because they tend to be the easiest. You can kind of draw a direct uh, correlation between uh, X to Y, uh, where you have, you know, if this happens almost like in tax law, right? So you hope, <laughs> you hope in tax law, there's there's usually a direct corollary between if this happens, then you need to do this. Um, where there's more squishiness and clearly other parts uh, of the legal system, then that's that's going to be different. So good call, good question. Um, a couple of additional questions. One of them I'll, I'll talk about, which is the threat to privacy. Um, I'll address that in my section. But there's one question that you might be able to help with, Joe. What technical background might be useful for future lawyers who want to work on these kinds of issues? Ah, there's there's so many different avenues to go down. I've had attorneys come to me and say, hey, do I need to need do I need to learn how to code? And I don't think that's necessarily the case, but I think that if you open your eyes to the idea of potentially learning about some of those things or working across discipline, we talk about the T-shaped attorney, those attorneys that um, across the top, they may know a little bit of project management. They may know a little bit about accounting or, or uh, business development or coding or other things, but then they go deep on their whatever practice area they're in. That broadens the horizon, especially around technology as we start to get into different uh, disciplines that will touch all of this. Um, so hopefully that helps. Uh, and I just added in the, the chat, um, Satoshi Nakamoto, I believe it was, and yes. it was bitcoin.org that you Thank mentioned. Thank you. So. Thank you for doing that. No problem. Um, Got it. Um, I think that um, we'll, we'll, I'm sure that there will be other questions that come up as we continue moving forward, but I'll go ahead and jump in um, if nobody minds. Sounds and, great. Uh, hopefully you guys can see my screen in just a second. So again, thanks, Joe. I mean, it, it is, the future really is now. What we're seeing is really happening. And, and I think, I love that you touched on this idea that we've always seen, which is, well, law firms are never going to adopt that kind of technology. We are late adopters. We're last to join the, the, the party. Um, but I think what we're really seeing is that um, your clients are there, so you have to be there. So we're really kind of pushing forward um, into this new technology, whether it's kicking and screaming or whether it's really because we love this stuff, which I think you, you will see that Joe and I do love this stuff. So I just wanted to, to reintroduce myself. I'm Diana Ikatani Iorlano. I'm the owner of a law firm called Ikatani Law uh, in Los Angeles. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I am a data security and privacy lawyer primarily, but I also serve as an outside general counsel. And I was a litigator for many, many years uh, at Manat Phelps and Phillips in Los Angeles, which is a big law, national law firm uh, before going out on my own. Uh, I, I have developed an expertise in privacy 
um, mostly out of necessity. I have a nine-year-old and when he was two and started to use his tablets and his apps, uh, it was really important for me to understand you know, what he was looking at. So I went and um, learned a lot about privacy, got my certifications from the IAPP, the International Association of Privacy Professionals, which are those letters uh, to the left of my name, the, the Certified Information Privacy Professional for the US, for Europe, and for Information Privacy Program Management. So um, let's see. Sorry, I have to close the chat here really quick. OK. So as, as we jump in here and we talk about, oops, sorry, the future of law, and I think we're already there, right? Those of you who are litigators have seen you know, e-discovery and using algorithms to or tags to search your documents to find out what's there because we're keeping so much information these days, right? Our clients don't throw anything away anymore. And so you've now got to sift, sift through emails and databases, but then also text messages and things that are on their phone. Uh, you need to try and serve discovery for all of those things. When you are, you know, back in my day, I've been a lawyer for 24 some odd years now. Back in my day, we used a dictaphone, right? But now you can actually type something into your email and it will predict what you're going to write based on things you've written before. Uh, that's predictive text. You guys are using those things now. Um, and as Joe talked about, the artificial intelligence implications are, are incredible in our profession. You know, we are, we are sort of uh, charged with making decisions quickly as, as attorneys. And I think that things that help us make those decisions quickly uh, have always been useful in our profession. But now what we're also seeing is that the, the demographics of our profession are changing. You know, there are millennials, there are younger people who are in uh, uh, it, practicing as lawyers throughout the country, and it's becoming more diverse. Uh, there are women, there have always been women in the profession, but I think we're seeing that uh, the demographics are changing as are the demographics of our client bases. And now with COVID, you know, we've made this shift to remote work. So all of a sudden, all of us have had to become IT experts, learning how to connect and how to connect securely and what types of things our clients expect. You know, having these, these Zoom webinars has become a daily function. Whereas before, I think many of us were like, ah, I don't wanna do a video conference. That's, that's just not my thing. So times have changed and sort of propelled us into using more technology. And then obviously with, with the internet, our clients are international. You are interacting internationally with so much of what you do these days. If your client has a website, it's going out there to all reaches of the world. And you know, in my world, we have to comply with GDPR, uh, which is the European Union's data privacy law, or you've got the California privacy law, you've got a new law in Virginia about privacy. So folks that have websites are having to comply with international law in a way that they never had to look at before. And then, like I touched on at the beginning, you know, we really are looking at what our clients expect of us and keeping up with the times and being technologically savvy, doing things that are the state of the art. Um, you know, your client is not expecting you to fax them anything anymore. You have to know how to email it. You have to know how to share it. So those things are all factors that we're looking at with our practice of law and, and how technology is going to affect that. But some of the things that I wanted to talk about also are, are you know, implicit bias. And I know that Joe talked about the algorithms being used and implicit bias doesn't have to be a, a negative thing. So to define implicit bias, it's a form of bias that occurs automatically and unintentionally in many cases, but it nevertheless affects our judgments, our decisions, our behaviors. And uh, when we hear implicit bias now, it's often in the, in the concept of diversity and inclusion and sort of looking at racism or misogyny. But I, I want to kind of pull us back to that idea that this is, it's just automatic and unintentional. It doesn't need to be nefarious. And I think there's this moral component of saying implicit bias is bad. But I think what we want to do is minimize implicit bias, right? Minimize those extraneous factors that ca get called in, especially when it is unintentional. So even when you talk about what does a technology lawyer look like, uh, I'm a technology lawyer. I have colleagues that are technology lawyers, and they may not look like what you think a tech lawyer would look like. Maybe you didn't expect an Asian female to be a tech lawyer. Maybe you didn't expect, uh, you know, an older person to be a tech lawyer. But I think, you know, they come in all shapes and sizes. And so we have to look at what do we think a criminal defense lawyer looks like 
those types of biases. Um, but then when we think about use of technology in the legal profession, we also have to look at who's creating the technology. You know, is the technology being created by people who are going to use the tech or is it being created in the Silicon Valley by a group of people that may not have legal tech experience? Um, so I think you have to look at those issues and, and I think you have to look at that really important as a really important factor with what clients are using, right? So who is using the technology? Is it a law firm that's using the technology? Um, and as I said, you know, traditionally law firms and lawyers have been late adopters of technology. Uh, I think that when I started out, we were still using WordPerfect for DOS. So some of you may not even know what that is, but um, you know, moving into the 20th century and, and the 21st century and beyond really requires you to understand who your audience is, who your targets are. Um, and as Joe talked about, and, and as one of our questions talked about, we have to consider what the algorithms are that are the basis of the technology, right? What is the decisioning that's happening? And frankly, who's deciding that this if means this then? Um, because if it's not somebody who's been in your shoes for the application you're using the tech for, it may become irrelevant or it may be flawed. And that's what we're really talking about with implicit bias and kind of moving through what the ethical implications for the practice of law are of using some of this tech. So moving on to like where in the legal profession we see implicit bias and the impact of artificial intelligence, you know, it's all over our profession. So I've given you a few examples here from recruiting to consumer law to criminal law. And I just wanna jump into a few of these different concepts, which is, you know, Legal recruiting is one of the biggest areas where you see implicit bias because you know it's been proven that when you recruit, just as a person going in and looking at resumes, there is an implicit bias that comes from perhaps um, the spelling of names or the gender of the candidate or the background of the candidate. Um, but now what we have is massive technology helping us find candidates for everything. So when you post a position uh, for whether it's a summer associate, whether it's an associate partner, uh, in-house positions, you're going to post and you're probably going to post it on LinkedIn or Monster or Indeed or one of these, these big companies that gets you the most publicity. Because the idea is always more applications are better because then I'll be able to pick from the cream of the crop. But what we see is you get inundated with resumes. You get a thousand resumes where you might have gotten 50 before and no one has time to look through those resumes. So then what do you do? You find ways to cull them down. And it may be, okay, I'm only gonna pick from the top uh, 20 law schools, or I'm only gonna pick people who had a 3.5 GPA or higher, or I'm only gonna pick from people who are in this geographic area. And unintentionally, that may lead to law school bias. It may lead to diversity problems for your pipeline. And so it's, it's sort of an old fashioned look at artificial intelligence because frankly, we would have been looking at those resumes ourselves individually. And, and I was the chief recruiting officer at Manat for many years. So I did that work, um, but finding technology ways to sort through those things is helpful, but we have to be considering whether or not that's contributing to the implicit bias that might be there already. And then uh, one, of, one of my good friends, Don Dennis, who I think is on this call, uh, pointed out to me this amazing, uh, really, really so interesting social experiment with Microsoft Tay, which was a chat bot that was created for Twitter. And um, this chat bot was put up to try and simulate, you know, a 19 year old American girl, what she would tweet, but it was pulling from existing tweets and trends in Twitter. And what it ended up doing was creating within 16 hours, this monster that was racist and misogynist and um, Microsoft actually had to pull it down 16 hours after the experiment started because it was pulling from AI, you know, just things that were being said, things about uh, red pilling and, and just things that it, it, it was at the time of Gamergate. So there was a lot of misogynistic um, language floating around there and it really backfired. And I think we see how that is. And, and obviously in the current and past climate, political climate, you could see how that could really go haywire. 
so you know when you're using these types of things or, or trying to use AI to assist you, uh, you really have to consider the source, right? Where is the basic information, the underlying data pool coming from? You know, we see it in, in false advertising and unfair competition claims for you litigators. Um, I posted on my LinkedIn recently a New York Times article that talked about a gambling app in the UK called Skybet. And what Skybet was doing was actually collecting consumer profile information, actually finding people who were prone to gambling and pushing more ads to them. And, and when you think about what is there from a privacy standpoint, right? Um, GDPR and the European Union allows people to get that information through, through discovery. They actually got this information as well. Um, but they found out that they had created a profile on, on this person that included information about the size of his mortgage, what kinds of loans he had. And, and it's, again, amazing and terrifying when you think of targeting targeted advertising appealing to your very biggest weakness. So you're going to see more of those types of claims. And I think that some of the privacy laws like the CCPA, like the Virginia Privacy Act, are really going to push this idea of what information our business is collecting about us to the forefront. And it will allow a little bit more transparency. It doesn't necessarily stop them from doing it. So you have to be aware that, you know, the, the most recent, you know, uh, reveal of the Facebook breach, you know, Facebook collects a whole lot of information about us. Um, and it can be your preferences, it can be your family members, it can be all of these different things that maybe you never intended to have used in a commercial way. So you can think about that. Um, when we look at consumer law and, and discriminatory pricing, you know, when we're talking about things like um, financial services or um, buying a car, you know, what kind of a loan are you going to get for a car? Um, in this FTC versus Liberty Chevrolet case, higher prices were charged to African Americans and Hispanics that were coming into these New York dealerships, um, but they were targeting advertisements to that demographic in certain areas and doing a, a little bit of a bait and switch. They were advertising cars that would be at X price but then when somebody came in, that car was gone. Um, but they sort of knew that they could charge them higher interest rates. And, um, you know, there was also some low tech racism going on where uh, the car salesman would, would note that it was an African-American or a Hispanic family and tell them that there were additional fees, document fees and processing fees and just really tack it on. But it came from these targeted advertisements that went out into certain communities. Um, we look at real estate discrimination in the HUD versus Facebook case. HUD actually uh, filed an action against Facebook because of those same targeted ads that led to what we're talking about with Skybet and the gambling addiction. But these were housing ads and uh, the ability in Facebook to use lookalike audiences. Um, so Facebook ads have this ability for you to say, I want you to get me other people who fit this profile of people I already know by my products. Um, but the categories are protected classes, some of them. You can choose uh, someone who's Christian. You can choose someone who's Muslim. You can choose somebody who's child free. You can choose somebody who is unmarried or divorced. Um, and those of us using Facebook don't know that that's why those specific ads are coming. But in this instance, it, it, it resulted in some housing discrimination where some new housing units were really being pushed to Christian and childless families. And the, those ads wouldn't show up for people in other demographic groups. So it's, it's um, pretty interesting and frightening to see those things. Um, in the financial services world with gender discrimination, you know, the Goldman Sachs uh, was got into the consumer lending business and was offering Apple the Apple card. Um, what happened in this particular case was that one of the, the, the wife of a man who filed jointly on taxes, who lived in a community property state, for all intents and purposes, their income was the same for both. The wife received a, received a credit limit for $57, that's it. The husband received a credit limit for 20, 20 times more on the same data. So 
we have to, again, continually look at where the data is being pulled from. Um, and then, of course, in criminal law, you know, we have facial recognition technology already. It's being used um, by law enforcement. But we also know that it's been notoriously bad at misidentifying uh, minority groups. So if you're working from a pool that may have difficulty identifying one Asian American against another one or an African American against another one, um, should you be using that tech? So th I think those are the kinds of questions that we as lawyers need to keep looking at for our clients and, and sort of asking our clients, what is the technology that you're using and where did it come from and how are you using it? And also asking our law firms, are we using this kind of tech? How are we using it? Who decides? Um, and it's been shown that there are benefits to eliminating bias, right? We've seen these studies that say that diverse teams actually are more profitable. Women-led companies may have more profits and fewer lawsuits. So I think as we look at these uses of technology in law firms and in our clients' businesses, um, the, the idea that we, we want to promote our clients being transparent and inclusive, you know, that is a huge marketing point as we also talk about social responsibility and those really desirable qualities that are happening. Um, so it's things to think about. And I'm sort of speeding through because I know that we may have questions on these items. So, um, and again, as lawyers and advisors, when we're talking about the ethics of, of these items, you know, I don't think we can merely be bystanders. I think that you need to ask your clients about the technology that, that you use or that they use to understand their business, but also understand how they're applying it because they may ask you to take a data set that's come from what might be a flawed algorithm. And then for instance, for, for lawyers that do litigation, you know, if you're telling your client, hey, pull this data set for me, um, they may be using a data set that's not really what you want, but if you don't understand how they collect the information, you might not be able to get that underlying data set and that could really hurt you at the time of trial or through discovery. Um, I think you wanna ask whether the models that are being used, the algorithms uh, or the data set, uh, are they consistent with the constituency that you're gonna use this product with in the future? You know, If you are buying tech from China is it applicable for what your use is in the United States or vice versa? Um, you, you need to kind of understand what the methodology is behind that. And I know that's a daunting task, but I think that as we as lawyers just kind of have to roll with these increased uses of tech. And again, you know, is, is transparency there? Is accountability there? Are those part of the algorithm? Or do we really not know where the information is coming from? Um, are, are, as we look at the amazing things that Joe talked about, you know, have these things been rushed to market or are they reviewed? Are they peer reviewed? Are they independently tested? Do we have a way of knowing whether this brand new thing is accurate, is reliable? Um, I think we have to look and ask those questions. Uh, and, and then obviously businesses need to look at whether or not the tools that they're using will reflect the demographics that they're serving. So for law firms, you know, there's so much happening in legal tech right now, whether it's uh, predictive timekeeping, which I think is amazing, right? A, a timekeeping system that is on your network and it is just sort of evaluating how much time you're spending sending emails or working on documents. And it's doing all that without you having to lift a finger. And as somebody who is stuck in the billable hour world for so long, that's really, really, really appealing to me. But how much access does that have to everything that's in your database? You know, do those companies know that they need to limit uh, the type of information that they view or share or analyze? Uh, and where's that information going? Is there a human on the other side of that? Is it just a machine? Uh, is it being stored somewhere? Is it being stored in the cloud? Is it being stored overseas? So these are all things that I think we need to look at as lawyers and really kind of understand, I, I know it's a terrifying concept that you have to stay on top of all of this tech, but then again, I think that it will only serve your clients better. Uh, and, and I think it's kind of fun to learn in your own lives. Some of you may just say like, forget it, I'm retiring. I don't wanna learn any of this stuff. <laughs> I'm not sure. 
Um, but I think that uh, it's, it's, these are really, really interesting times. So with that, uh, I will open it up for questions again, or Joe, if you have any comments, I'm happy to hear them. No, that, that was fantastic. My goodness. Very, very helpful. So we do have a few questions for you, um, if you'd be so kind. The first one looks like, uh, what do you anticipate regulation will look like for tech or AI and provision of legal services? Oh, I, I mean, honestly, I think our problem is always that the legislation lags behind the tech, right? I mean, we're seeing this in privacy. Obviously, these privacy issues have been around forever. We have two you know, states that have adopted a comprehensive privacy regime. So when we're looking at tech and AI, you know, I think it's incumbent upon people to, to reach out to your legislators and say, hey, this is going to be a huge issue. What are you doing to protect me as a constituent, you know, to, from this thing? Um, a lot of times you do have a voice with your legislators to say like, hey, my sheriff's department is using uh, facial recognition. What's going on there? Um, you know, and, but I think you do have to get involved and, and understand that. So, um, I think that it's it's going to be sort of catch as catch can, and I'm sorry about that, but I think that the legislation just won't be there yet. So there's a lot of sort of rogue shoot 'em up, you know. It's sort of a wild west. No doubt. No, thank you for that. That's great. Okay, so there is uh, two more that have actually popped in. Um, who compiles the data that shows the discrepancies between credit for males versus females? When you were talking about that portion before, I think. I don't know that there's, you know, I think that there has been research done on it. Um, I, I would Google it because I don't know off the top of my head. So I apologize. Um, and maybe Thompson Reuters can help with that, <laughs> finding that information for folks. But I mean, it, it has, you know, even in that Apple card case with Goldman Sachs, even Steve Wozniak said, oh, the same thing happened to my wife. So, you know, it's happening at all levels. And I think you know, I don't know who compiles it and I don't know who who would police it, frankly. I mean, other than, you know, the FTC, the usual suspects, right? The FTC here, HUD, whether it's the CFPB, maybe, I don't know, uh, depending on the type of product that's being offered. Perfect. All right. Here's one quick one. It looks like, what are your thoughts on ethical AI certification programs? Have you seen any of those recently um, that out? I, I haven't seen any but I'm sure that some of our ethics experts, you know, in the ABA would know that. Uh, I think it's a burgeoning area. I think that if you could do training on ethical AI uh, or take classes on it, it, it's something I would love to attend or learn more about, but I don't, I don't know of any off the top of my head. Wonderful. All right. There was the, the original threat to privacy concerns, but I think you addressed that during your, your talk. Yeah. Uh, and and um, if Mr. Loggins has any other questions, feel free or feel free again, like Joe said, you can reach out to me. Um, my information will be in the slides. You can reach out to me separately um, at a future time because I know we're running out of time. But I mean, obviously, so much of this tech is a threat to privacy, in my view. Your personal privacy is being used because you are a data subject, right? The things that you do online and frankly, you know, even now, you don't have the option to do a lot of things offline anymore where you could go to a bank. Maybe you don't feel comfortable doing that in COVID anymore. And so you're conducting more of your banking online. Um, you know, I, I think that it's just got to be something you educate yourself about. And, you know, you can ask for those opt outs for privacy. You can look at companies that will delete your information. Um, you can stop getting so many marketing emails. Um, you know, you have those rights especially if you're in California, but you may have those rights nationwide as well or internationally, obviously. So one last comment, which I almost feel like it, it it's perfectly describes where we're at and the, the concern around some of this stuff, there's again, tons of potential, but what the comment basically says is one of the most important things coming out of this briefing is the importance of companies and countries that are developing these capabilities is that they are doing things, what is legal versus what is new. So they're thinking about this stuff in advance and they're versus what maybe we're doing in the United States, maybe we're uh, reacting rather than thinking proactively about it, um, which is something that I think we all have to sort of reflect on and think about too, so. Uh, well, I think Deborah has some thoughts on the ethical AI. So Deborah, if you'd like to answer that, um, that'd be great. Don't know if you're able. I, I yeah, there you go. 
I saw you unmute, but I can't hear you, Deborah. Yep, sorry. For some reason, my camera is not uh, letting me. Uh, I'm experiencing technical issues. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, but no, I think you answered you answered it perfectly. So. Great, thank you. And, and I agree with one of those last comments. It's it's scary. It's fabulous. I, I want to thank everybody for attending here because you are uh, educating yourselves and learning more. And there's just so much more to learn. I mean. Joe talked about stuff that I'd never heard of before that I want to learn more about. Uh, and I think that this is just going to be a burgeoning area um, for all of us to, to learn more about. So. Yeah, thank you all, Diana. That was wonderful. I really appreciate um, all that you brought. Tons of things to learn from you. Um, I appreciate everyone taking the time to uh, listen today. So thank you very much. And Joe, and Joe and Diana, on behalf of the task force, I want to thank you for your time today. The information was fantastic, equally frightening, uh, and the information is, is changing so quickly that, you know, a week from now we can have a discussion about some new developments. Uh, but want to thank you on behalf of the task force and our co-sponsoring committees, the Cybersecurity and Data Privacy, as well as the Committee on D Diversity and Inclusion. Uh, all of the participants will receive copies of the slides. They will have Diana and Joe's information in them. Uh, they have welcomed you to reach out to them with any questions or further discussion on these issues. Uh, it's gonna take me a while to process all of this, <laughs> so, uh, but you may be hearing from me. Uh, just a housekeeping matter. We've had a couple people ask for information regarding CLE. These are designed to be informal lunch and learn and they are not approved for CLE, but we hope that you enjoyed the information and like me will need to process it. Um, also want to thank Norma, our TIPS staff, for putting this together and administrating it. If you're not a member of TIPS, please go to AmericanBar.org and search for the TIPS page and join us. And then we will be doing our next Lunch and Learn program in June. But Diana and Joe, fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you both. all. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Good day, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.